it's so good to see so many Yaleys who are not part of the, of the problem. <laughs> and to see all the rest of you as well. <laughs> as many of you know, um, I'm alive without doctor's permission. <laughs> For over a year now, uh, my bags have been taxed, and I'm waiting for the ticket. Or, because God is sneaky, maybe surreptitiously, the ticket has come, and tonight I'm in heaven. <laughs> it doesn't get much better. Maybe it's the heavenly old home week. I remember in 1969, at precisely this time of year, uh, as, as, at the end of supper, my dear, day brightener of a son, Alex, age 10, has to be excused because Calvin wanted him to throw the ball around. And only a few days later, with a not-to-be-believed expression on his face, here comes Calvin himself to the chaplain's office saying, I've been drafted. And I said, oh shit, oh no, not the army, the Cowboys. And sure enough, at the end of the fall season of 69, he was the Rookie of the Year. Thank you, Calvin, for coming back tonight. And thank you, dear David, uh, my, my son David, and Yehudi, the violinist that I call him, Nelson, and also David Warren, thank you so much for coming, and to dear Janet, old friend, they don't come any better. And uh, as for Peter and Noel, keep hope alive, uh, as Jesse would say, and they've done so from two score years and five and still going. And first, I want to thank uh, Harold, the Dean, for presiding over this occasion, and especially John Linder, who did all the nuts and bolts. Anybody can talk, but organizing, ah, that takes out. And finally, I would like to thank my beloved wife, Randy, without whom I would not be here, and without whom I wouldn't want to be anyway. <laughs> now, what I'd like to say could be said in a Jewish context, Islamic context, but uh, I must speak as a Christian because we're under the auspices of Yale Divinity School and because I am very, very grateful for being a graduate of YDS. Arthur Miller, a blessed memory, once wrote, I could not imagine a theater worth my time that did not want to change the world. I feel the same way 
about religious faith. It should want to change the world. The blood then tied loose in the last century claimed more lives than in all of all wars in all previous centuries. And the present century is filled with violence and cruelty. We see more intent on fighting God's will than doing God's will. Therefore, the most urgent religious question is not what must I do to be saved, but what must we all do to save God's imperiled planet? Spirituality takes various forms. In many faiths, some are very profound, while others, particularly these days, appear to be a mile wide and one inch deep. Urgently needed for our time is the politically engaged spirituality. I believe Christianity is a worldview that undergirds all progressive thought and action. The Christian Church doesn't have a social ethic as much as it is a social ethic called to respond to biblical mandates like truth-telling, confronting injustice, and pursuing peace. What is so heartbreaking is that in a world of pain, crying out for shame, so many American churches today are basically down to management and therapy. A politically engaged spirituality does not call for theological sledgehammers bludgeoning people into rigid orthodox. Nor does it mean using scriptural language as an illegitimate shortcut to conclusion, thereby avoiding ethical deliberation. We have constantly to be aware of hard choices informed by the combination of circumstances and conscience. We insult ourselves by leaving complexities unexamined. But never must we become so cautious as to be moral failures. For example, if the income polarization in our country is more characteristic of third world nations than can be found in Europe or East Asia. Determined to funnel federal dollars to religious institutions, President Bush is not only fudging separation of church and state, he is reneging on his constitutional obligation to promote the gender welfare. He is actually putting charity in the path of justice. For what the poor need today is not piecemeal charity, but wholesale justice. <laughs> we are the only advanced democracy without the national health care system. 
American churches need to understand that while charity seeks to alleviate the ill effects of injustice, justice seeks to eliminate the causes. Charity preserves the status quo. Justice demands liberty and justice for all, a more democratic, egalitarian future for all citizens. In the book of Numbers, Moses says, Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. In his day, Martin Luther spoke eloquently about the priesthood of all believers. In our time, how about a prophethood of all believers? The seminaries, seminaries could greatly help. If the poor are very much on God's mind, they should have a prominent place in the curriculum. How, may, how, how much attention is paid to the poor in biblical studies? It's worth checking. In church history, in preaching, theology. And why in the academic world are theology and ethics so sharply distinguished. In prophetic theology, they don't even interface. They are one. And let's be clear, the goal of prophetic theology, like the goal of biblical prophets, is not to chastise, but rather to heal, to enhance not diminish humanity, because, as the old church father said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. Clearly, Paris clergy could use a little more starch. They are gumption deficient, but they also need more instruction for the seminaries to face difficult situations that lie ahead. Same-sex couples are not about to go away. And civil union, praise be Connecticut, to join Vermont, they still, civil unions don't provide benefits equal to those it's a two married couples. The problem is not to reconcile homosexuality with biblical passages that condemn it. The problem is to make Christians face up to the fact that everything biblical is not Christ-like. And that Christians are called upon to worship uh, the Word made flesh, not the Word made words. Of course it is. Oh. We all know it. Torah, an abomination in the book of Leviticus, for a man to lie with another man as with a woman, but it's also in the same book, Torah, to enjoy barbecue ribs and Monday Night Football because it is an abomination even touch, to touch the skin of a dead thing. <laughs> I'm glad you're not the fundamentalist, Calvin. <laughs> the religious really right is also not going away.
As Robert, as Robert Kennedy properly observed, what is dangerous is not that the extremists are extreme, but they, uh, that they are intolerant. Almost equally dangerous, I would suggest, is the sense of superiority that keeps theologians and biblical scholars from taking on the whole world of the world because they don't consider them worthy antagonists. I sympathize. But when the delusional is no longer marginal, but has come in from the fringe and occupies the center of power, more, more people have to speak up than only brave journalists like Bill Moyers or Seymour Hersh. Pollution too is hanging around. Scientists the world over have collected mountains of evidence against global warming. What Bush declares, the jury is still out. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the Yale Law School and its graduates, or the National Lawyers Guild, whose president, I think you see it tonight, the former deacon, Michael Lavery, were to mount a suit against the administration for failing to pro provide for the common defense. The suit might be called frivolous, but its guaranteed publicity would make a wonderful educational tool. To religious uh, believers, global warming is a reminder that nature has been divorced from nature's God. They must re -wed. Because finally, only reverence can restrain violence, be it against each other or against nature. And lastly, nuclear weapons are only going to proliferate. Prophetic theology would declare that only God has the authority to end all life on the planet. All we have is a power. And a politically engaged spirituality would point out that what the nuclear nations are practicing is nuclear apartheid. A handful of nations have arrogated to themselves the right to produce, deploy, threaten to use nuclear weapons while policing the rest of the world against their production. Such an arrogant policy is not politically expedient, not in the long run. Nuclear apartheid has no more chance of succeeding in the world than the racial apartheid in South Africa. The only way to stop nuclear proliferation is to recognize that nuclear weapons demand a single standard. Their total abolition, ours included, under the most stringent possible international control. A policy that keeps the world only minutes away from annihilation is a fine example of fighting, not doing God's will. Kofi Annan says the abolition of nuclear weapons is at the top of the UN agenda. Why is it heading the agenda of every church, temple, and mosque.